Bye. Oh, welcome to module six on discourse and grammar. In recent years, there has been interest in patterns of grammar and vocabulary that combine to tie meanings in the text together, as well as connect the text to the social context in which it occurs. That is, items that combine together to make the text cohesive and give it unity of texture. Grammar, or syntax as it is sometimes called, deals mainly with the structure of individual sentences. It is basically about how words combine to form sentences. Some people think that grammar is about how to write and speak properly, but grammar in linguistics does not try to lay down how people should speak and write. Rather, it tries to describe how people actually do speak and write. A text or a discourse is a stretch of language that may be longer than one sentence. Thus, text and discourse analysis is about how sentences combine to form texts. Let's take, for example, these three sentences. Combined this way, the three sentences fit together to make an acceptable text. In grammar, we say that a sentence that doesn't work is ungrammatical. In text and discourse analyses, we say that it is incoherent. One of the key issues in text and discourse is to find exactly what it is that makes some texts hang together while other texts are incoherent. Again, in this example, it's not hard to see what is wrong. The words, which is why, are placed at the beginning of the first sentence. So, there is nothing for them to refer back to. This gives us a feeling that we are in the middle of a text and that we have missed the beginning. We can see from these examples that a coherent text has certain words and expressions in it which link the sentences together. Expressions like which is why and the use of repetition are known as cohesive devices. In discussing coherent sentences and discourse grammar, we look at lexical cohesion and grammatical cohesion. Lexical cohesion includes word repetition, using synonyms, superordinates, and generals, and opposites and related words. Grammatical cohesion includes substitutes, ellipses, reference, and connectives. Now, let's discuss first lexical cohesion. One thing that makes texts coherent is repeating important words. Look at this example. You will notice that many words are used more than once in this text. Some words occur several times. Some are function words. Some are content words. By looking at how many times some words are repeated, we get to see that they are important. If these words were not repeated, the text would make very little overall sense. This may sound like a bizarre way of looking at words, but these words provide coherence to the text. Another lexical cohesion is synonyms. Using different word class with a related meaning is another way of making texts hang together. Instead of repeating exactly the same word, some texts employ a different cohesive device. They use a word and then use a synonym of that word. Look at this example. The words employer and boss do not always have exactly the same meaning. 
but are close in meaning. It can get boring if the same word is repeated, and this is one reason why synonyms are used instead. There is a feature often found in texts that is rather like using a synonym. Look at the words breadth and wide here. They are similar in meaning, but the other one is a noun, while the other is a verb. So we cannot call them synonyms. However, it is clear that the words are linked in the same kind of ways. Next, we have superordinates and generals. Another way of linking words in a text and creating coherence is to refer back to a word by using what is called a superordinate term. Here, you can see that the link is between Brazil and the country where Brazil is a specific instance of the more general word country. The general word is called a superordinate and the more specific one is called a hyponym. Hyponyms themselves have hyponyms as you can see in these examples. Next type of lexical cohesion is opposites and related words. Other relationships between words can also be used as cohesive devices. One such relationship is when two words or phrases are opposite in meaning, like in this example. The words males and females are opposites. Using the two words near each other obviously enables the writer to express a contrast but it also contributes to the cohesion of the text now let's go to grammatical cohesion first we have substitutes special words like one do and so which replace words that have already been used look at this example the word one substitutes for the noun tissue the word does stands for the verb joins so replaces the clause she is very plain the substitute enables such repetition to be avoided here are examples of noun substitutes in this example, one replaces center and concept. However, it can also replace two words like a region. This means that it is not strictly accurate to say that one is a noun substitute since it can replace more words like in this example. One can also substitute for a noun phrase like in this example. Moreover, the word do can also be used as a verb substitute. Remember that do also changes into other forms like does, did, done, and doing. Take this example. Did replaces the single word wrote. Here, it replaces loved him. And here, do replaces heard how these remote islands became attached to the crown of Narnia. So, just one could substitute for a noun or a noun and some of its modifiers. It is clear that do can substitute for just a verb or a verb and some of its modifiers. Now, let's look at ellipses. In certain contexts, it is possible to leave out a word or a phrase rather than repeating it. This device is called ellipses. In this example, you may observe that the place where words are left out are marked with a symbol. Here, meetings have been omitted. 
And here, imitate his parents have been omitted. Leaving out words in this way is called ellipses. With ellipses, we need to be more specific about the kind of modifier that allows ellipses of the rest of the noun phrase after it. For example, instead of an article such as the, a noun phrase may begin with a word such as some, other, or all. Take this example. After these words, the whole of the rest of the noun phrase can be left out. But of course, the preceding text should make it clear what is meant. Here is another text using the word others to form an ellipsis. We also have verb ellipses, as you can see in this example. This illustrates how we leave out the verb and any modifiers to the right of the verb. Look at this example. This shows that we can also use an ellipsis to leave out a clause, and all that stays behind is a question word like what, how, or why. We now turn to some special words which need help from their environment to determine their full meaning. Because of this, they are important in creating cohesion in texts. They are reference words. These are words which don't have a full meaning in their own right. To work out what they mean on any particular occasion, we have to refer to something else. In this example, the reference words are he, we, it, its, this, today, and larger. In the first sentence, when we come across the word he, we know that we have to find a male human being to whom the word refers. The words a businessman tell us what is the meaning of he on this occasion. The same is true for the other reference words. When we refer to a certain context, we either have an exophora or endophora as a form of reference. In this example, we have an exophoric reference because the names Alice and Hernan are dependent on context outside of the text. This means that when we talk about Alice and Hernan, we need to have context to understand who these people are. Moreover, when we refer to people, space, place, or time, we use the term Dixies. Here, you can see the lists of words that are identified as person Dixies, spatial or place Dixies, and time Dixies. In this example, we can see person Dixies used to refer to the exophoric reference of Alice, Sharon, and Rita. Another form of reference is in the fore, which refers to items within the text. Look at this example. We see here a pronoun used as an anaphora, which means that one person dixes they is used to refer to the names that are mentioned first. If the reverse is true or if the person Dixis is mentioned first, as in, in this example, we call this endophora as cataphoric reference. Lastly, we have connectives. Some words and phrases are used to indicate a specific connection between different parts of a text. This is where connectives come in. These words are conjunctions, like, but, adverbs like nevertheless, or prepositional expressions like in spite of. The term connective 
does not refer to a part of speech like conjunctions or adverbs. It is because they all do the same job of linking parts of a text. We have four basic types of connectives. We have addition connectives, opposition connectives, cause connectives, and time connectives. Well, that's it for this session. We hope you have learned some basic ideas and techniques in the analysis of texts and discourse and the connection between discourse and grammar. See you in Module 7. Till then.